Hi, everyone. This is uh, a panel called There's No Place Like Home. I'm Paula Martinak, and I'm going to be kind of steering it, uh, being both moderator and panelist. Um, and we're going to introduce ourselves. We have, we have four people on the panel. We're going to introduce ourselves just briefly. I'll tell you something about myself um, first. Um, I primarily write historical fiction. And um, my latest novel, my sixth novel, Testimony, um, has just come out from Bywater Books. It takes place in 1960, and it's about um, a professor at a women's college in Virginia in 1960, and she's hiding her lesbian sexuality, um, which causes problems for her, um, and results in an investigation that, that takes up the major part of the book. Um, Right now I'm living in Charlotte, North Carolina with my wife and uh, we both teach at UNC Charlotte. Uh, so that's it for me, let's, let's move on to Sherry. Thank you, hi everybody. My name is Sherry Reynolds and I am a fiction writer too. I write literary fiction mostly, I write some other stuff too. Um, I have a brand new novel that is gonna be out in about two weeks it is, um, it's called The Tender Grave. Here's a picture of it. I'm so proud of it. Thank you, Anne, for, Anne McMahon, for this great cover I've got here. This is my first novel that I've ever published with Bywater. Um, I've published six other novels. And um, in the other part of my life, I'm also a professor at Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia, where I'm also the department chair um, for a little while longer until I can escape. Um, I do, I'm, I'm lucky to love both parts of my life, but I've missed my writing life while I've been an academic administrator. Um, my new novel is really, it's a story about two sisters. The youngest one has just committed a hate crime against a kid in her high school class. She runs away to escape um, questioning and prosecution and she tries to find and does find her half sister from her mom's previous marriage only to discover that her sister is a lesbian. And so that sets off all kinds of things in motion. Anyway, that's it for me. And I, oh, I'm in Virginia. I live on the Eastern shore of Virginia in the town of Cape Charles. And that's where I'm hanging with you from today. Thanks. Great, thanks. Anne. Yes, my name is um, Anne McMahon. Um, I also write fiction. I have um, just finished my this is horrendifying, as my niece would say, my 11th novel. Um, this book is called Covenant. It is the fourth book in a Jericho series. Jericho is a, an idyllic, um, fictitious town I created that's on the New River in the Southwest Virginia mountains. This book is uh, pretty much a departure from the others in the series because it tackles some darker themes, which Frankly, for me, um, given events that we've all experienced in the last year of our lives, I felt like I, it was really the only way I could write. So um, I've got, it's not out yet, it comes out in July, but I have this, here it is. I'm getting it back from my editor today and expect it to be a fraction of this length um, when, um, when she returns it. But um, I've lived in North Carolina for 46 years. But um, all of my friends and neighbors still call me a Yankee and probably always will. Um, I've also written books set in Southern Indiana, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Vermont, in addition to North Carolina. So I think you could say I have commitment issues. <laughs> I generally write about religious themes and uh, protagonists who are riddled with self-doubt and ennui. So I guess you could say I write autobiography. <laughs> okay, and Sally. Hey, me. Yep. Hi, um, I'm Sally Belrose. I'm an RN, a grandmother, a gardener, an ex mill worker. I once washed and folded Moha and handed Muhammad Ali his socks. I was born in Holyoke, Massachusetts. I was raised in Chicopee, two working class towns in Western Mass. Um, I transplanted myself to liberal Lesbianville, the Lesbianville of Massachusetts, Northampton, also in Western Mass in my 30s with my partner of over, of over 30 years. My, let's see, my 94-year-old mom still lives in Chicopee. It takes me about 30 minutes to get to her. Um, 
but let me tell you, there's a big, um, despite the proximity of the two communities, there's a big difference between making a home in Northampton and uh, different experience from making a home in Chicopee, especially decades ago. My latest book, Fishwives, uh, is, is pretty much about home in the sense of feeling at home in oneself and community, um, as well as the idea, the, the idea of geographical home and actual shelter, sheltering in peace, and the feeling of belonging in yourself and with your partner. Um, yeah, what else? Um, I guess that's all I have to say, um, it, except that I do write. I, I'm, I guess I'm a regional writer because I write a lot about Chicopee. Most of, most of what I write is about Chicopee, takes place in Chicopee. I have written about people going to other places, but they always end up back at home. So I'm a working class queer novelist and I'm in a happy home, but I'm still looking for home. So that's me. <laughs> Okay, great. So, um, so how did we all end up together here? We're all <laughs> Bywater Books authors, Hi. so that put us together. Um, three of us live in the South, um, though two of us are, are transplants. Me, just six years ago, but but Anne, quite a quite a long time ago, and and Sherry is a, a native Southerner. Um, so the three of us have that. Um, Sally's a Yankee who lives in Massachusetts, but her short story, Sunflowers, was selected by one of our great queer Southern writers, Dorothy Allison, um, for inclusion in a Southern Gothic anthology. So we kind of came <laughs> together around that and decided that we were going to talk about this idea of setting and place in fiction, um, which is an Im important piece of, of all fiction writer, of all fiction writing. Um, I like this, this quote from, I'll quote you, Sherry, that you said in the email, which I liked a lot a place space isn't the same for everybody who inhabits it. You can't pull apart place and character. I thought that was really great and kind of the essence of what, what we're gonna try to do here. So, so some of us have, have already touched on this, but the first thing we wanted to talk about was um, where our writing, where we would say our writing is planted. Um, what landscapes and places inspire us? Um, and I wanted to kind of throw in this question too, to, to talk about, do we ever know the setting before we know the characters? Um, obviously, Anne, when you're writing a, a series that, that would come up, but I, I wondered about it for the rest of us too. So um, anybody want to, to jump in there with the, the where your writing is planted and, and what places inspire you? Well, I, I'll, I... I almost always write about Western Mass. It's what I know. But, you know, I, sometimes I have my characters go out of Western Mass. They go somewhere else. So they're in a different setting. But they're always, so far, they're always from, even, they're always from Western Mass, even if I'm not talking about the setting. And they're mm -hmm. always of a certain class. So that class is also home to me. I'm a very working class. I'm stubbornly, rigidly, maybe, working class, even though, you know, I was born poor. I always call myself working class because we don't seem to say poor anymore. I was born poor. So um, I'm stubbornly working class, poor working class. Um, so, so that's how I always think of my characters. Even if I don't speak of where they're from, that's where I think of them from. So for me, home is also a class thing. Mm -hmm. So no matter where I put my people, they're always from a class. And I always think of them as from Chickabee or from Holyoke, even though I live in Northampton, that's where that's where I seem to always land. I, I'm in a middle class, in a beautiful middle class house now. You know, I became a nurse. And, but home for me is always, par partly always Chicopee, even though I love Northampton. Northampton saved me. I love Northampton, but home still is Chicopee to me. Yeah. It's Milltown. Yeah. Home for me, I, I said this to some of you, home for me is always going to be Pittsburgh, which is where I'm from. Um, and my I moved away when I was in my early 20s, but I but I lived there again, just about, uh, we moved six years ago and, and Katie and I, my wife and I lived there for 11 years. And so it always feels like home, but but I don't write about it, <laughs> um, yeah. which is sort of interesting. But but for me, what, what inspires me, and I, I have different thoughts about why I don't write about Pittsburgh, but I, I am very inspired by 
any kind of physical landscape that is that has history to it. Um, when I move to a place that doesn't feel like it has much history, like there are large swaths of Charlotte that just seem like the history has been erased. Mm -hmm. um, but when, when we moved here, I've, I've told this story a lot, but, but I'll tell it again. Um, when we moved here, we moved to a, a neighborhood that used to be a cotton mill village. And I was very, very taken with the houses, with the mill housing. And there were a lot of um, the houses that were the original mill houses, um, the same size, you know, three or four rooms, very, very small. And so the place kind of took me to um, the character that I wrote about in the Ada Decades. Um, and, and it really, it's, it's just a visceral thing for me, historic landscapes, old, old buildings, uh, anything like that will really, will really move me to, to write. And testimony, um, testimony is actually based on, very loosely based on a true story that happened to a, a professor at UCLA in the 1950s. But I have no connection to California at all. And I didn't, mm -hmm. didn't really <laughs> want to do that. And, and I do have some connection and some, some experience um, in Western Virginia. And so I moved it to, to, to that area. And uh, uh, so any place there that I have some kind of connection with the historical landscape, I'd say is, is where I'm gonna, gonna um, place my fiction. And I, I've written books set in, in um, several different states, but they're all places I've lived. You know, they're all places that I know in some way. Um, and I remember this is kind of, will sound unrelated, but it was actually like a little light bulb that went off for me, Paula, when you talked about, do you ever know um, where you're gonna set a story before you create characters? Mm -hmm. And I was kind of like, wow, you know, I, I never really thought about it quite that way. But many years ago, I was fortunate enough to hear the great mezzo-soprano Marilyn Horn. And Marilyn Horn, for those of you who don't follow opera like I do, grew up in a very, very small town in upstate Pennsylvania, Bradford, um, which is very, very close to where I grew up, um, not far from Lake Erie. So uh, I, I hung around forever, like, like good groupies and stalkers and got her autograph and um, dared to tell her the name of the town where I grew up. And it's a town called North Warren. If you know anything about Pennsylvania, I don't know if you know this, Paula, you know that's where the state mental asylum is. Yes, that was my childhood right there, so it's perfect. So when I told Marilyn Horn I was from North Warren, her eyes got really big and she kind of chuckled and said, well, I guess we've got some of the same water in us. And I never forgot that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then years, years later, um, I, I um, heard Doris Betts do a reading in Greensboro. And um, she read from the, a, a story, it was a short story that later became part of a novel she was working on. And um, in the story, she writes about a child who was saved from drowning. Um, the, the baby's father was literally trying to drown this baby in the kitchen sink. And a neighbor happened by and saw it through a window and burst in and saved the child. But Doris Betts wrote that throughout her life, inside that woman was a drop of water meant for drowning. So it occurred to me that, you know, no matter what I write or who I'm writing about or where it is, there's always that drop of water, you know, that, that stays inside all of us, that probably for you comes from Pittsburgh, maybe, you know, but for me certainly comes from the one place I've never written about, which is the part of Pennsylvania where I grew up. So it seems like you and I, Paula, could maybe put a porch on a shrink's house. <laughs> So I, I have, I don't want to, I want to get to Sherry, but I just wanted to add there though, I have, we could talk about this too, like have, have we written about home in other, um, in other ways? Like I think I've written about Pittsburgh, I've transported Pittsburgh a little bit to the south and I, I could talk about that yeah. um, in a little bit, but, um, but I did want to hear from, from Sherry about, about this. I love that idea, that, that drop of water that's always in there. So my early books were all set 
in the place that I grew up. And that was in South Carolina, um, along the little PD river. I mean, yeah. I, even though I didn't use the names of, of places in, in any of my works, I was so infused with those landscapes. And for me, it's tobacco farming, um, the smell of curing tobacco, um, and those rivers, you know, the little PD, the Waccamaw river, these dark waters, um, with, with lots of cypress trees and Spanish moss hanging down and being in the shadows of that. And I've been gone from there since I was 18 years old, left quick as I could. I did not fit in and I love it. Like I have both pieces there, right? Like this, this desire for this thing that also made me sit. Like the, these pieces were both alive at the same time. And I could drink that river water by the gallon and you're not supposed to do that. Um, but I mean, I just, I, I love the flavor, the smell, the depth of that that kind of a landscape. So my early books were definitely um, imagined there. Um, my last three books have all been imagined where I live now, and that's on the eastern shore of Virginia. Um, I'm in a little town called Cape Charles. I um, We live two blocks from the bay. We walk down to the bay every day. Um, a lot of my new book, The Tender Grave, is, is set literally on the beach um, and actually on the bay itself or on Route 13, which is the road that runs straight up to, to Maryland. Um, my character never quite gets to Maryland, but she's always trying to get to Maryland for uh, one of my characters is, is, is up and down the stretch of highway here. And it's a stretch of highway that is beautiful, but it's, it's farms and churches and dollar generals and, um, you know, <laughs> poultry picking plants and, and food lions and, and more fields. And it's, it's a lovely, but a also depressed kind of a landscape very different from the one that I grew up in and also very similar to the one that I grew up in. And my character, um, so so I have in my new book, um, one of the, the main characters is named Teresa. Her partner is Jen and they're trying to get pregnant. And, um, and Teresa has moved to the area and Jen is from the area. On the Eastern shore and in the town of Cape Charles, they say you're either a come here if you weren't born there and don't have generations of family, you're a come here or you're a native or a from here, right? And this tension plays between these two women because Teresa is always afraid that if and when they do um, have a child, that they will, that their child will be bullied or ostracized, that they may not, um, you know, that, that it may not be an easy journey because they're the only lesbian couple in their town. Um, Jen, who is from that area, is always trying to placate her and is always saying things like, oh, but there's, you know, they're opening a Montessori school or if things are bad here, um, <laughs> there's a friend's school in Virginia Beach or we'll pick right up and move if we need to. And so Jen is trying to appease Teresa and to help her. Um, and at the same time, what's really clear is that it's a, that the conversation is about so much more than about where the child will go to school or what will happen to the child because at its root, Teresa feels unsafe in some small way, even though they're accepted by their community and Jen um, isn't feeling the same thing or isn't feeling it to the same degree. That's not really about the place. That's about the their perceptions of the place. But the yeah. interesting piece about that to me is that a landscape isn't the same for any two people inhabiting it, right? right? That right. the same geography means something yeah. so different depending on what we each bring to the place that we come. So in the same way that I bring South Carolina into Virginia, and even though my novels now aren't set there, and even though my characters aren't me, that little Petey River, those smells of tobacco are inside. Those um, drops those of water inside you. Yeah, yeah, that's right. right. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I have a, a question too about community. I mean, who feels, you know, how how does community play in all this? Because you know, I'm thinking of the the characters in my book. One of them, it, it starts out in 1955. So one of them feels okay. She had she feels she has some community. She has people she you know that she plays pool with. She plays cards with, and the other the other woman does not. So you know how you feel safe at home in a community if you have other people other women to relate to you know in the same in the same landscape and these women are both from the same place but one of them feels okay in that landscape the other one does not 
So they, you know, they keep moving around. And also there's, you know, does the community, does the greater community allow you to be, to be safe in the landscape? Yeah. So yeah. the landscape plays on you, you play on the landscape. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I, I feel like with, um, in, in testimony, I have, um, you know, queer characters who have, have established careers in a place, in, a, in an academic setting, in a university, and they've worked a long time to get there. Um, and they, it, it is like the queer diaspora. They've come from, you know, other places in the South where they lived and didn't feel like they belonged. And then they get to this place where you can form a sort of community, um, the academic community, the, you know, the women in the novel form a community as well, um, the women academics. Um, but then you have this, <clears throat> this threat um, that comes and, and hurts the community or, or, you know, kind of destroys that community or destroys that, that dream of like, oh, I could make this home. Because, you know, again, it's, it's taking place in 1960. So it's not, it's not safe to be out. It's uh, people have to go away from uh, the small town to, to act on, uh, you know, there's a, <clears throat> excuse me, a gay male character who has to go to the bars in Richmond, which is like two hours away. So there's that sense that you can't, even though you've, you've formed this community there, you can't really still be yourselves. And, um, you know, I think about that a lot in terms of queer diaspora, which I do write about. I always write about people kind of going to, to other places um, to be openly queer. Um, and that, but maybe the place that they go to isn't, isn't ideal either. Like they think it's going to be, but it right. ought not to be. It's the, it, it, it puts me in mind too, of how do we change the, you know, in this, in this sense, I'm talking about the landscape as community or as the, you know, how did, how do we like in 1955 and 1960 and onward up to now, how, how did we individually and as, as queers, how did we change that landscape, you know, so that because in 1955, there was few places you could go to, to make, you know, to make home, to, you know, it was hard. You just kept looking. I mean, not that we're not all, all looking, but, you know, you went from place to place. You tried New York, you know, maybe it was a little easier because you could get lost, but then you're lost, you know, <laughs> depending on where you're from. Yeah. So how did we, how do you change, how does the person change the landscape? You know? How does the person change, change what's happening around them? I mean, we certainly did it as a community. We changed the sort of cultural, political environment to make right. home a little easier, for some of us a lot easier. I always tend to think about the, the you know, I, I tried to think really deeply about the whole concept of home and what that means, not, not only what it means for me personally, but, you know, how I think about it as a writer. And, you know, I feel like for me, it functions on two levels. There's kind of home in the sense of the sort of actual physical place you live, you know, like where you're, where you're physically mm -hmm. planning. But um, I guess for me, more home is a more aspirational idea. It's yeah. more like a, a narrative metaphor, maybe, you know, since I tend to write more about people who are um, pilgrims, I guess, who are constantly searching for that idea of home wherever they find that, you know, without necessarily kind of changing their physical location to go and seek it out in, mm -hmm. in, a, in another venue, but really trying to find it sort of more internally, um, you know, in that sense. You know, and I wondered about something Sherry said a, a minute ago too. You, you know, it's always seemed to me that part of what happens as we age is we're, we're kind of like the pot of minestrone on the back of the stove. And we sort of cook and distill down into the purest versions of who we are. And a lot of things sort of just fall away. And I mean, I wonder if that isn't why for, for us as writers, those basic, really basic, but central things you mentioned like sights and sounds and smells, you know, and tastes are, are so important and they're, they're really kind of, they, they sort of transcend um, a lot of the other considerations, you know, because they, 
they really sort of define who we are, you know, in a sense. I don't, I'm not saying that very articulately, but I'm just wondering. Yeah. I don't think you ever get out of your first home, whatever that is. As much it's as you fun. want to. And, <laughs> well, and, I, and maybe you have to dwell there in order to appreciate what it gave you, but sometimes what it gives you isn't what you want, right? Like there, this is this is a piece. Um, so in, in my book, in my new book, I have a young woman who has committed this hate crime. And so she has attacked a gay boy in her class. And it's not until she leaves and goes and finds this sister who is a lesbian and goes, uh-oh, right? And, and she, and she kind of hates her, but she, kinda, but she likes her partner and she kind of wants to stay there. And she realizes that she didn't really hate gay people. Like that it wasn't really even personal. That it was, he was the target because that was what the world around her said the target should be. And she hadn't even gotten out of that. That's a function of place in part, right? It's not only a function of place and it's certainly not only in the South it's, and it's certainly not everywhere in the South. But the world that said, I mean, in her school, um, the teachers would say, if he didn't act so gay, he wouldn't get picked on all the time. Right? So there are these messages that are coming from a place mm -hmm. and the place allows those messages to live. And the fact that they live and are a part of her world when she's developing and, and trying to figure out what's right and wrong in the world, um, that allows this action to happen. It doesn't change her responsibility for it, but it complicates it, right? So she leaves that world. She goes to another place where the same set of beliefs don't exist and she suddenly sees that differently um and this is i think why it's important to tell stories i mean i think that this is a, that this is part of what i hope our writing can do is to show the world in a multifaceted way that's beyond what we can actually perceive if we've lived it if we've lived it if it's true if we've really been infused in a place then you can't see that place it's only when you get somebody else looking at it and talking with you about it and you see it from a different place that you can that you can change some things. So that's, I mean, that, that, that's a, a long stretch from where this conversation started. But I mean, in terms of what I hope the books do that I write, I, I suspect other people feel that way, is that um, we see um, more possibilities and different possibilities based on what our characters can discover that maybe we couldn't. But we see them through the lens, right? Through the lenses that we carry with us, you know? So like in a sense, is it like this Homeric thing where we're all trying to get back to Ithaca? <laughs> well, in my case, it ain't all that. <laughs> yeah. Now I was thinking as, as you were talking, Sherry, uh, to get back to that, that, um, that little tidbit that I brought up earlier where I think I bring Pittsburgh into the South um, because when I wrote The Eight of Decades, and that was the first one that I, the first novel that I wrote after we moved here, um, and that was the one that was so, I had the landscape before I had the character. And um, when people read it, and, and when I read from it in public, people said, well, how can you how were you able to do this? You're from Pittsburgh, <laughs> you know, how were you able to, to write about this, this town? Um, how were you able to write about Charlotte? How were you able to write about being a Southerner and growing up? And, and I thought about, I, I hadn't really thought about it, but a lot of the stuff that I brought to the novel were things actually that I experienced. Um, for example, the, the first line of the novel is, um, Ada's, Ada's daddy kept a postcard of three dead colored men in his toolbox. Now, my dad didn't have a picture of, of three black men, but he had a picture of um, dead Japanese soldiers from when he was on Iwo Jima during the war. And this, I hadn't really thought about it, but this, this is where I got it from. I got it from home. You know, I got it from this idea of something. It, it was racial. You know, it was it was a, a racist thing. They had taken pictures of these dead soldiers and preserved them, and it reminded me of, of lynchings. You know, it reminded me of that, and so I was able to kind of. I was able to bring that up in in myself and to imagine what that would have been like for for 
Ada, the small girl who, who found this in her daddy's toolbox. And so it wasn't a huge stretch for me, like the whole, and, and much like you, Sally, I, I grew up working class. And so this idea of the girl who grows up working class and then is able to switch classes because um, by virtue of education uh, was my story too. So those things, like when I said, I, I don't write about Pittsburgh, but I do in a way, you know, I, I, I bring them into other settings, I think is what I'm trying to say. And I think that's what Sherry, that's what you were saying as well about the memories of South Carolina are being brought and, and that experience of being brought with you into your writing now. And that's kind of what I was trying to get at with that whole, you know, distillation idea, you know, that, you know, that we all share so many commonalities, you know, um, like a drunk daddy is a drunk daddy, regardless of where his couch is. Yeah. You know, and those are things, you know, that we can all kind mm -hmm. of know and pull up and relate to, yeah. regardless of where we're planning a story. Yeah, I think, you know, I think we're all looking for a place to shelter, you know, a place to, a place to, a place to be safe and at ease. At that's ease. Home, that's, right? To be at that's ease. Home. Yes, wherever, yes. That, wherever that ends up. Yeah. Being. I've never thought about. Um, where I wanted to set anything, but I would, I can see that that would be very different. Of course, if I was doing a series, you would, you would have, but even if I were doing a series, I probably wouldn't have thought about it on the first book, right? It would have happened in the first book and then I would have followed right. wherever that story took. Right. Me. But for me, I, I think that, um, that, that place is enormously important, but it's so embedded in character and so much a part of character and character is always the thing that I start from. I'm mm -hmm. always coming from a, um, you know, a, a who is this person and why are they in the situation that they're in and how are they going to get out of it or whatever. And then I use the place um, because sometimes place is not much beyond a backdrop. Um, it, it could be, but sometimes it's just, it's just the locale for, for a set of events to happen, but then everything changes depending on what that place is, right? You have to use it yeah. in, in some kind of a way, but sometimes place is a huge piece of the conflict, depending on whether or not the character is at ease and is comfortable in the space, or if there is discomfort in the space, if that space is rubbing against the character, mm -hmm. then it can become mm -hmm. a, a major part yeah. of the conflict. Well, and also that that can, I'm sorry, that that can change for a character too. Like we said that place is different for different characters. It's also different for, for the same character at different times. Right. Uh, yeah. So like what I was saying about testimony where, where my, my character, Jen Ryder, you know, thinks this is it, you know, I'm, I'm at this great college, I'm, I'm teaching history, I'm doing what I want to do. And then boom, she like, you know, is involved with a woman and her neighbor sees her and everything's, everything's blown to bits. So, um, you know, then the place looks different to her and she wants to go. <laughs> so there's that too at, at different times and, and you know how we see things differently as children too and then it looks different as an adult, so. Yeah. My, and my characters basically stayed in the same place for 60 years plus, but you know, because they're 90 years old and they're telling the story sort of front to back as they're, you know, driving to a dump, they, um, you know, they get to tell a story as the, you know, they did, they were in a couple of different places, but mostly they're in the same 50 mile radius. So they get to look at their lives and because they're 90 and they love each other and they've been through this messy life together, they get to tell a story over all this time. So the landscape does not change that much, but they, they change and they change the landscape as they go. So it's the same landscape, but they're, and they're always, you know, looking, they love each other, but they're, they're always looking to be at ease with each other. And sometimes they are, and sometimes they're not. And sometimes they're at ease at where they are. And because of the culture, they get, you know, batted around a lot. So, um, so finding home is, is part of, and it's, you know, it's the story and this, I really believe in story as a way to find shelter for each other. So, you know, they're telling each other the story of their lives at the end of their life as a way to, you know, mm -hmm. to make sense of what, what's happening, of what happened. Can't take time out of it. And that's what you yeah. do with that, Sally, is, I mean, I think in, in Fishwives, 
you definitely um, look at how the how time changes place. Like what is possible yeah. in yeah. in the same place is is completely dependent on time or completely influenced by the time. So that wide spe spectrum is an yeah. important piece. Yeah. That actually happened for me too. It's it's a little similar to you, Sally, with with the eight of decades, but it goes from it goes from start to to end. She ends up at eighty five. It starts when she's twelve and it ends right. when she's eighty five. Right. And so the neighborhood has changed. The people have changed. At the end, um, and because the neighborhood is based on my neighborhood, it's it's like I'm kind of one of the characters where the people who are gentrifying the neighborhood are, are coming in and people from the north are coming in. And so the, the place has has kind of changed around her um, so that she can be a lesbian. Finally, <laughs> it's like she yeah. doesn't, you know, she, she doesn't have to to worry about it. She's not teaching anymore. You know, there are all these things that have kind of fallen away. So it's the, it's the same kind of thing where where um, plot comes through the how the how the place changes over over the course of time and setting has such a has such a huge um part of of plot always always for me yeah me too yeah. for for me but i i'd really be interested in what you what you think about that or if you have like an example from oh, your... char the characters change the setting yeah so, yeah so at one point, I think the well, at least one one way. So my two characters, maybe they've been together for six or eight years. One of them goes, and they're not getting along at all, mainly because they keep get, getting kicked out of places. So, um, and because one of them really wants to be monogamous, and the other one is like, yeah, I don't know. So uh, she goes to Florida. She come. She gets caught cheating. They they um, have a very rough time. And they realize that they need community. So they just go after in a huge way community. So they find community, they find a way to have people, other lesbians to be with besides themselves, which is hugely helpful for them. They, um, one of their best friends moves back to the area to be near them and they find a community. But they also at the same time, um, are changing the community so that they're, you know, politically and culturally, so that they become more accepted in the community. So the both both those forces are happening at once, as as it did, as it, at least for me, as it did in life. So so that's how that's how the setting was changed. Yeah, and also, um, you know, there's there's a lot about. I, I wanted this book to to be about class, about two women striving to get out of class, but not making it, you know, it's like, because that is what happens in life. I've seen it, you know, in my own family and my own people I know in myself, I was able to become a nurse and I'm very proud of that. You know, I mean, it was a, it was a struggle. I had to work myself as most, as a, many of us, you know, if you came from a certain class, it was very hard to, it's not easy to get out of that class as maybe some of you know. So but there's all these books about, you know, this Horatio Alger stories, you know, about how, how you get out of the class. Well, a lot of people don't. So I wanted this to be, have something to do with people trying to get out of class, but not necessarily making it, ending up in a neighborhood. But I wanted them to love their neighborhood because I love the neighborhood I came from. I have a mixed feelings about the neighborhood I came from, honestly, but I also love the neighborhood I came from. It was, you know, there was more you know, am I going to say this? Yes. There was more diversity. There was certainly more, you know, in some ways it just feels more like home. You know, it's like, first of all, it's like my mannerisms, you know, who I am in the world is just more, it just feels easier. You know, I don't, I don't, not always choosing my words. I'm not always, I just feel like I don't have to sit up straight there. You know, <laughs> it just, it's just, maybe it's just because who I am, it's where I'm from, you know. So well, I, you know, they built that and they ended up there. So they changed, they changed because they were comfortable in their neighborhood in the end. Well, I had, I had pretty much the opposite experience. I mean, I, I, um, I guess, yes, for me, I don't believe that you ever really do change your, yes. you know, 
it, it's kind of like, you know, the whole British thing with the working class accents, you know, that you can never quite conceal, yeah. you know, um, that thing. But for me, it, 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 it's not, it, it's not like a, it's not like welcoming to me to think about that, you know, as a place where I felt more belonging or, or more safety or whatever. I, I always think in terms, I think I write my characters this way too, that they're always kind of pulling, pulling all that stuff along behind them, like it's in a roller bag, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and, and you can never, it's like you, you want to leave it, you want to ditch it somewhere, or empty it or drop it off, but you can't ever quite do that. You know, it's always there. It's like shackled to you or it's stuck to the bottom of your shoe, you know, like toilet paper and you can't quite shake it off. So I think that comes through really powerfully in the way I write characters, you know, that regardless of where they're from, that, that we're all sort of together on the same journey, pulling that stuff along behind us. And, yeah. and along the way, we discover how many commonalities there are, you know, in the things that we each have in our suitcases. Oh, it's, I think both. I think both can be true. You know, there's some stuff that, mm, and there's well for me anyways. But there's a way I feel more comfortable with what what's left behind. Yeah, yeah it's kind of like the freedom to sit down after Thanksgiving and un unzip your pants. Yeah, right. You know, and yeah. not have to worry about that. Yeah. So that that part I totally get. Well, For those of us who are actually wearing pants and <laughs> I know we can't, we can't. Okay, everyone stand up. <laughs> so it was interesting for me when, when we moved back to Pittsburgh and I was, I was 49 when we moved back to Pittsburgh and I hadn't lived there since I was 24. Um, and it was, although, although it felt like home to me, it was not, people kept asking me where I was from. Right, right. <laughs> And it was that that kind of thing, and it, and I it was almost like and in Pittsburgh there's this this very kind of fierce Pittsburghism too, and it's, I mean other places do this as well, but it's kind of like, you know you're supposed my my boss in Pittsburgh was always saying remember where the Isleys was down the street, and it's like no I don't, oh. I don't remember that I didn't live here most of my life, so um, you know there were there's this kind of credibility that you have to you know, that you have to know where certain places are or something. But um, I think that's part of why I don't write about Pittsburgh too. I was thinking about, you know, I sort of don't, I feel it and yet I, and yet I don't, I feel outside of it. I lived in New York City for, for 22 years and, and there, like the minute I arrived, people said, oh, you're, you're not from here, where are you from? And there was a lot of, um, you know, condescension at, at that particular time about being from Pittsburgh. So I don't know where I was going with this. I was going with the idea that, that I was trying to get back to why I don't necessarily write about home and how you can be from a place, but, but not from it at the same time, which is kind of, kind of a strange thing to say, but Anne, you might, you might feel that as well, since okay. you, you also said you don't write about no, I, I feel like um, I, I don't write about Pennsylvania. I haven't had enough therapy yet <laughs> you know, to be able to do that. I mean, I think ultimately, and, you know, I'm probably running out of time here, but, um, you know, I think, I'll, you know, one day maybe I actually will be able to write about it, you know, at least, I don't know. I mean, I, I aspire to be able to do that. I hope one day I will. You know, and in the meantime, I kind of, I kind of carry what I, what I drug along behind me um, to my life here in North Carolina, which I love, and, um, and, and, and the amazing thing for me is all the, all the commonalities I keep discovering, you know, in some of the sort of bigger experiences we all share, regardless of where we, you know, came up, and, and that those languages ultimately are the same, aren't they? Right. Yeah. Well, I aspire we to have the same vocabularies. Yeah, I was thinking maybe. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say maybe um, you know we could kind of start finishing up, or as as a final thing here, talking about where we are. There places that we aspire to write about, or are there places that have inspired us, and we just haven't gotten around to it yet. I was just going to say I aspire to write about somewhere else. <laughs> anywhere else. <laughs> <really>. <laughs> 
Yeah. I don't think you could, I, you know, I, even though I'm not my characters and I, I'm always in all of my characters, but none of them are actually me. Mm -hmm. But I think that no matter where I took them, I mean, I could set them in Madrid. I could move to Madrid and I could write an entire novel there, but it would still be, um, my characters would still have the American South, the concerns about um, race, class, religion, um, you know, homosexuality, all these pieces that have been in, that, that are such a piece of me would still be there even if I'm, you know, writing in, in, in another country. So I don't think it would be taken away. I, I think that it would, it could be an expansion and it could be a lot of fun. And I think we ought to get to write about wherever we want. Like, I, I like the idea of being able to take an experience that I'm basing something on that happened, you know, in North Carolina and imagine what it would look like if it was in New Mexico. That's fun, but it's not going to, you can't really lose the piece that is, you know, place is inside that character. And it just always seems to be for me. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, 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 I think setting is very important, but I think character is, you know, everything, <laughs> not everything, but it's character comes first for me. What, what about you, Anne? Do you have some place you aspire to write about? Um, aspire to write about? Probably not. Um, fear <laughs> to write about, but no, I should. Yeah, probably where I grew up. Yeah. You know, across the, um, in the shadow of the um, asylum. Yeah. yeah. I like this idea that that Sherry brought up, and I, I very much it very much resonates for me that I um, that I just think I will bring those sensibilities from from my upbringing in Pittsburgh, which was very different from every place else I've lived, which was different from New York, different from from where I live now, different from I also lived in West Virginia. It was it was different from there, but um, yeah, that that no matter where I go, I think I'll be bringing parts of that with me that it'll find its way in. I think that's just just the way it is. And, you know, I always say someday I'm going to write about Pittsburgh. And, uh, but it never, I've written a couple of short stories, but I just don't, they felt kind of flat in terms of setting. Usually my setting is pretty, pretty distinct and pretty vivid. And for those, it was like, eh. Not so not here, here's, here's what I think about that. The rest of you can go. And Paula, you need to see me five times a week. <laughs> Besides, what you could do is you could always write whatever you want and throw French fries on top of it. There you go. <laughs> right. That, for people who don't know, is about Permontes, which is a, a, Pittsburgh style. a Pittsburgh style, yes, burger, where you get everything on top of it. You get the fries right on, right on top there. <laughs> but I, I actually have never had that, Anne. Really? I, I am a proud Pittsburgher. I also do not watch the Steelers, but... <laughs> well, that, I don't blame you for that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So any, anything else? I, well, I, I did that, that one thing that, that Sherry said too about wanting to write about different places. That, that has come up for me, the, the idea that do we have permission to write about, about any place? It came up for me when I, was, when I moved here and was, was starting to write about the South. It's like, you know, can I really do this as a northerner? And then I and then I thought, well, when I moved to New York and wrote about New York, nobody said to me, you can't write about New York. You know? And it, it felt like just something that people kind of either thought about the South or that it was something that I took with me about the South. Um, but, you know, I always, when I teach setting to my students, I always say, you can, you can set your story anywhere you want, as long as you do your research and as long as, you know, right. you you know what's going on. It's no different than, you know, they, they like to write fantasy or they like to write sci-fi. And it, it's like, well, you have to do your homework for that too. It's, it's all in your head, but you've got to, you know, you've got to do the research and it's all got to make sense. So it's the same thing um, in terms of setting. But I wondered if anybody else had, had thoughts about that. I know Sherry said she wanted to be able to write about anywhere. Let me throw one more thing out real quickly. I don't, I don't think that I have ever in my life named an actual place in any book that I've published. 
I mean, I definitely. You mean, you mean a real place? A real place. Like I may refer to something in the, I'll refer to going to Virginia Beach, but I definitely am not using the town name of Cape Charles in this novel or the three previous, the two previous ones to this one. Part of it is because I like the fictional, I, I like to be able to fictionalize. So my attention is to making it as real, as palpable, as sensory as possible. Mm -hmm. And yet I don't want anybody fussing at me because the town zoning board would never allow a right. hotel <laughs> yeah. to right. be doubling as a deli and a barbershop, right? <laughs> so I so I fictionalize so that I don't have to. And it's given me a lot of permission, I think, to be able to use things from different places. I also don't want anybody to be going and saying, well, we don't really have, you know, a dry cleaners on Strawberry Street. I'm like, you are on the wrong path if that's what you're doing, <laughs> right? Because I'm after something that is more impressionistic, but also more powerful than the actual map can be. And so in that way, I think that that, that, that freedom has been um, a good piece for me to be able to to blur things because I'm trying to make it um I'm trying to make it completely real but not literal. Right. That's all. That's all I got. <laughs> <laughs> well you must run into that too, Anne, with the because you've created Jericho. Oh dear God. Yeah. I mean I when I created this little town, I loosely based it on the town in Virginia where my parents lived at the time, a small town on the New River called Independence. And oh my God, every single person in that town got this stupid queer book and <laughs> read it and they all looked for themselves, right? Like, you know, the, 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 the gay florist and the undertaker and like you were saying the names of the restaurants and all that. And I mean, and every time I talked to my mom, she would tell me a story about how somebody was all upset you know, because I had imbued them with, you know, what he never had an affair with the state farm agent, you know, <laughs> like that. Whole, so yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's a constant, um, a constant battle. So, you know, if, if ever I, I, I make the mistake of writing another series, I'm going to set it somewhere where I know nobody, <laughs> nobody related to nobody. Right. So well, great. This was such a such yeah, a great fun. conversation that gave me a lot to think about for sure. I love the the drops of water idea. I, oh, Dorf Betts. Take it. Yeah. Well, great. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.